Um, as you said, my name is Michaela, and I've been working on the Portlands project for um, close to five years now, which is um, kind of mind boggling when I think about it. Uh, it doesn't feel that long, <laughs> um, but I really love this project. So I'm really excited to tell you about it today. Um, so what are we doing in the Portlands? Um, the Portlands Flood Prote Protection Project is about taking action to protect Toronto's downtown southeastern area from flooding. Um, our plan to do this is to reconnect the Don River to Lake Ontario by creating a new path for the river and a renaturalized river mouth. And in doing so, this actually creates a new island, uh, currently called Villiers Island, but soon to be renamed. And this flood protection unlocks land that was previously only able to be used for industrial uses to allow for a wider mix of uses. So why do we need to do this in the first place? Um, the Portlands were once one of the largest wetlands on the Great Lakes. Um, the entire area that you see today is entirely human-made land built by filling in the marsh in the early 1900s as Toronto made space for growing industry. The Don River was redirected in an unnatural hard turn into the Keating Channel which you see here, um, this is a photo of the construction of the Keating Channel from the early 1900s. And one of the unanticipated consequences of this was that it created a flood risk for a large portion of the surrounding land. Then the Portlands were envisioned as an industrial area and they were used for things like oil and gas refinery and storage, as well as a an aerial um, of the Portlands from, I believe, around the 1970s. Um, and you can see all of those white circles are oil storage tanks. So while the Portlands has the potential to be an amazing extension of the downtown waterfront, up until now, soil contamination from these industrial uses, along with the risk of flooding, have impacted its transformation from an industrial area. And so our solution is the Portlands Flood Protection Project. Um, if you're not aware of where the Portlands are, um, it's the area south of Lakeshore Boulevard from roughly Cherry Street um, to Leslie Street. Um, the Portlands are actually quite a large area and our flood protection project focuses on a fairly small portion of that um, that you'll see here outlined in yellow. And this big blue blob that you see superimposed on this map is the floodplain before the flood protection project. So this is the area that when we're done, we'll no longer be at risk of flooding in a major storm. And this is roughly the air project area, and that's what it's gonna look like at the end of our flood protection project. Um, it has a new mouth for the Don River. And can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay, so that will help a little bit here. Um, so this is the existing Don River and here's the Keating Channel. We're extending the Don River south of the Keating Channel through a more naturalized meander until it reaches Lake Ontario. And then we have an extra, we call it like an emergency relief valve for floodwaters. That's this area down here, what we call the Don Greenway, that allows for floods to spill out a third outlet into the ship channel in a major storm. So the complete flood protection project can actually be broken down into 23 individual projects. I'm not gonna go into all of those today, um, but broadly it can be broken into four categories. Earthworks and flood protection. So that's actually digging the river and some other flood protection landforms. Uh, the parks that will line the new river valley, bridges and structures, as well as roads and municipal infrastructure. So let's start from the beginning, building a whole new river. This photo shows more or less what we started with when we broke ground in 2018. Um, it was, like I said, a big, mostly empty industrial area. The first stage was to build underground cutoff walls. And you can see them in this photo here. It's this big wall, essentially. Um, and these were built underground um, and they extend down to bedrock and surround the entire river valley. Uh, their job is to keep the excavation area dry and stable um, the water table here is very high. Um, this is Lake Phil, after all. Um, so the walls keep the sides of the excavation from caving in, and they also keep groundwater from seeping into this giant hole that we excavated. So this whole flat area has been excavated down um, to make room for the river. We excavated enough soil to fill up the Rogers Center, or the Sky Dome, and the excavated soil was treated to remove contamination and then mostly reused elsewhere on the site. 
Then we installed a special liner. So um, it's not feasible to excavate all of the soil all the way down to bedrock. So the liner prevents any contaminants that might be left in the soil below the river from seeping up into it. So in this photo, you see the big excavation area. These are those cutoff walls I mentioned, and this crew is installing the liner, what looks like a big plastic sheet. Um, it has several layers, and it also covers the entire river valley from cutoff wall to cutoff wall. Then we built up the new river banks on top of the liner. So there's a clay levee that goes on the outline of the main river channel. So that's this big hump you see here. And then we built up the river banks with some more natural finishes. So these trees you see here lying on their sides make up the outside of the river's curves, where we expect fast moving water to have the most erosive force. Several layers of trees with their roots are still attached, were anchored to boulders and then buried, leaving the roots still exposed. This is a really interesting bioengineering solution that's very resistant to fast moving water um, in a flood, but it also provides great aquatic habitat when we're not in flood conditions and in a way that is more like what you would see in a natural river. <laughs> and here you can see what that looked like when it was built up, but before we flooded it. So we've got our exposed roots here on the left, and then on the other side of the river where you see these little steps, these are what we call fiber encapsulated soil lifts. And you can think of them kind of like a burrito made of a coconut choir fabric wrapped around seeds and soil. And this fabric keeps all of the soil in place while the plants grow and get established. And then once their roots are established enough that they're holding the soil, the fabric naturally biodegrades. So it creates um, a, a more natural side to the river. And here's what this looks like once we flooded it. So we flooded this river um, in February of this year. And again, you can see we've got our um, exposed roots on the left and those steps, those fiber encapsulated soil lifts have started to grow in on the right and they are already starting to look a lot more natural. One of the really cool stories to come out of this project was the discovery of a historic seed bank. So we excavated quite a large area and we did it in different stages. So there was one section that we excavated and then we just sort of let it sit there for several months over the summer. And the sun shone and it rained a little bit. And the next thing you know, we saw these little spiky green plants sticking up out of the ground. Now we see a lot of weeds on site. Um, so seeing plants isn't by itself exciting, but these look nothing like the scrubby weeds that we see elsewhere. So we brought in some experts and sure enough, these are seeds that were buried um, along with the original wetland in the early 1900s and have just been sitting there waiting um, to be uncovered. So we worked with our partners uh, at the University of Toronto and Minokomik, which is our Indigenous consultant, um, to recover as many of these plants as we could. Um, University of Toronto has been doing some studies and regrowing some of the other seeds that were present in this soil. And this past year, we were actually able to replant some of these plants into the new river valley. So we actually restored these hundred year old plants back to where we originally found them. So that was really exciting. <laughs> Another um, big milestone that you may have seen is the new bridges that we built. So it's not very often that a city gets to add new bridges to its skyline. And we were lucky enough to add four um, across three locations. So this map shows you um, the general outline of the roads in the Portlands in our project area and calls out the three locations of the bridges. There are two bridges on, Key on Cherry Street over the Keating Channel. One is for pedestrians, bikes, and vehicles, and there's a separate one for a dedicated transit bridge. Further south, there's a bridge over the new mouth of the Don River where the river will flow into the lake. And then we also have an east-west crossing on Commissioner Street that crosses the new Don River. We asked our design and engineering team to create iconic bridges that would move transit, cyclists, pedestrians, and vehicles on and off this new island and across the Don River. And here's what they delivered. All of these bridges were built in Nova Scotia um, with some specialized parts built in the Netherlands. And then they were shipped to Toronto via the St. Lawrence Seaway. So this is the Cherry Street North Bridge, the one that bridges the existing Keating Channel. And the way we installed this one is actually kind of cool. It arrived on a barge and uh, it was already sitting on top of a turntable and hopefully this 
will work for you. Um, so once it got here, it was on this giant turntable and the barge went into the Keating channel until it was lined up with the foundations that we had already built. The barge let off some ballast to raise it out of the water. And then once the bridge was in the right place, we rotated it and then the barge took on more ballast to lower it back down slowly onto the foundations before driving back out. We'll watch it drive. And there it goes. <laughs> the other bridge on Cherry Street is the yellow one further south. This is the first one that we opened in 2022. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of dedicated space for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as obviously the requisite roadway for vehicles. And then the Commissioner Street Bridge um, is the longest bridge that we built. It has two arches. And now that it's open, you can actually go and see it has a really great view over the New River Valley. But my favorite detail about this bridge is actually underneath it. So the bridge has uh, support beams that run across it um, underneath. And for the most part, these are typical I-beams that you would see in construction. So they're big long steel beams that have a vertical part and a horizontal part that meet at about a 90 degree angle. Um, but in some sections, this join is sloped, like you can see here. Um, and that is to discourage birds from nesting above our uh, recreational trails so that people walking or biking on the trails don't receive any unwanted gifts from the birds. Um, but the bridge is quite long, so most of the support beams are that regular 90 degree angle, which gives them lots of other places where they could nest if they wanted to. So to dig into the parks a little bit, we're building 25 hectares of publicly access accessible green space, and it will become the only natural shoreline in Toronto's inner harbour. In total, there's 6.1 kilometres of recreational trails throughout this new parkland, and that'll provide access to the wetlands um, and you could go for a nice walk, you could go fishing. Um, we've created space to launch canoes and kayaks. Um, and there's also a really great playground gonna be on the north side of the river as well. So this image is sort of a zoomed in uh, section of uh, the western edge of the island, which is what we're calling the promontory, um, which is really just a fancy word for uh, an overlook with a nice view, like a high point. Um, and we built that by reusing some of the excavated material from the river that I mentioned earlier. So this promontory, this part of the park, will offer stunning views back towards the Toronto skyline and out to the river. It also includes an event lawn for major concerts or events and a gravel beach with a canoe and kayak launch. And we're also marking the industrial heritage of the Portlands um, by incorporating some of the foundations of the Marine Terminal 35 building and the Atlas Crane preserved on site. So here on the left side, you can see the Atlas Crane. Um, this is a designated heritage structure. It's the last crane of its kind on the Great Lakes. Um, we've reinforced it and put some cladding around its base to keep people from trying to climb it. And it will serve as a new landmark uh, in the park and a new addition to Toronto's skyline. I guess it's not new, it's been there all along. <laughs> but it, as part of the park, we'll have a much more prominent um, position. And then on the right, this is uh, the other heritage structure within the project's footprint. Um, it's the old fire hall for the area, and it functioned as the fire station for the Portlands until around 1980. And we actually had to move it back about 20 meters to make room for um, future dedicated transit lane on Commissioner Street. So this will um, stand in the entry plaza of the new park. It will have public washrooms and some other city parks facilities. And here's a rendering showing um, what that western edge of the island will look like. Um, you can see um, we've marked the footprint of the old Marine Terminal 35. Um, and this esplanade here will connect to the water's edge promenade that we've built elsewhere in the waterfront as well. And this rendering is a little bit deeper into the park. Um, it shows what we call Canoe Cove here, where you could launch a canoe or kayak. And then this tall hill in the background is that promontory where you could have a nice view over the city. So this is under construction right now. Um, these two photos show part of the retaining walls, like the interior retaining walls that will become the promontory. Um, 
So these will eventually have sort of a prettier facade put on them, um, but the structural um, integrity is there, which is the big first step. And then these photos show part of the playground we're building on the north side of the Cheltenham Badlands. Um, so it will have kind of a rolling hill kind of landscape um, with a cooperative water feature at the top for our kids to play um, with some water. And then at the bottom, it will have a sandbox um, and it will have trees and greenery kind of planted throughout. And here is Canoe Cove. Um, this area has, I think, five or six little islands built in it. And the idea is that they provide sort of a sheltered area where you could, you know, try out paddling for the first time. There's some obstacles to try and navigate around, some little islands to check out. Um, so these were um, built and planted a little bit earlier on. I think they were fully planted by the end of last summer. And this area, we've already seen wildlife really keen to come back. So on the left here, we have uh, someone from the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, one of our project partners. They conduct regular surveys of the fish around our project site. And I'm actually not totally sure what kind of fish this one is, but we have seen uh, a huge number of species in our area that haven't been seen there for a really long time. So that includes salmon, bass, pumpkin seed. Um, they found an American eel, which is an endangered species. So the habitat restoration that we're doing around the perimeter of the site um, seems to be working, which is really great news. The second image in is a pair of red-tailed hawks who have staked their claim on the new parks that we're building. I see them probably weekly hanging out on the site. Um, they seem to be doing really well. Uh, so that's always a good sign too. And then uh, the third photo in there, we have a heron that we spotted in Canoe Cove. I think this was maybe two years ago now and a mink, which has also been exploring Canoe Cove. So the wildlife is knocking down the door, ready to get in there. So before I wrap up, I just wanna show you a few more kind of before, during and after photos. Uh, the landscape architects that have worked with us on this design, um, Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, has created a number of artist renditions that capture the design and what we hope for in the Portlands. So here's a, a little bit of an overview. Again, we started with this sort of empty industrial space. Um, and in, in these photos, you can actually keep an eye on this smokestack because it will let you kind of orient you. So we started with this. Here's what it looks like now that we have uh, the river flooded. You can see waterfowl is just super excited to be in there. There's our little smokestack. Um, and as this area matures and grows in and the trees get bigger, um, eventually we would expect it to look something a little bit like this. And here's just another series, again, warehouses and parking lots and not a whole lot going on to begin with. Here it is now that the river's been flooded. Um, these were taken in the winter, but it's already starting to come um, much greener, which is really exciting. Um, this whole area and, and the riverbanks are, are starting to really come into color now that the weather's warmed up a little bit. Um, and then eventually, Oh, and actually I should mention here, we've got those exposed roots again, and here's our fire hall that I mentioned. So this is right in the center of the parks. And then eventually as the trees mature and grow in, um, you know, we don't expect the trees to mature right away, but eventually this gives you a sense of what the area will look like. Um, and the new parks and river will be open to the public uh, next summer, 2025. Um, that's what I've got for my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. That's great. Uh, just give me a moment. Thank you very much.